My name is John, and I'm 29 years old. Last year, I got married, and my wife Lena and I decided to spend our honeymoon in Ireland. We were absolutely convinced, seeing pictures and videos of its natural beauty. A quiet island. It would be the perfect place for our first romantic chapter as a married couple. Plus, Lena, being fascinated by Celtic mythology since she was young, only added to the enthusiasm. It was late September. We booked a room in a small and rustic hotel in Dublin. This place is beautiful, Lena said as she opened our bedroom's window, which led to a small balcony. You mean the hotel or the country? I mean both. This view is wonderful. Let's have something to eat and maybe then we'll go for a walk. It's still early, Lena proposed, excited. I'm in, I answered, hugging Lena. We went to a restaurant nearby. It was only 2 p.m. Then it was time to explore the surroundings. After a long walk, we were relatively far from the center of Dublin and into the heart of rural areas. Ooh, John, look at this cemetery. It's so pretty, Lena said, as we discovered what was, indeed, a very interesting graveyard. It was pretty much like a vast garden in which the graves and memorial stones and statues were surrounded by trees and benches. Meanwhile, it was already late in the afternoon and becoming dark. Besides me and Lena, there was no one else in the cemetery. Captured by the mysticism of the place and by the moment, me and my wife made love right next to a Celtic cross. It was quick, but passionate and definitely memorable. Before we left, we looked at the name carved on the grave below the Celtic cross. Out of respect, believe it or not, human emotions can be so strange, I know. It was a woman named Iris O'Brien. I remember that I also noticed the year of her death, 1928, but I didn't see the year of her birth. Well, in any case, half excited, half embarrassed, but definitely happy. Me and Lena decided to go to a good and genuine Irish bar and have a nice whiskey. Eventually, we went back to our hotel room, and by that time, it was already 1 a.m. Our first day in Ireland was perfect, and I hoped for the rest of our honeymoon that it would be this good. The next morning when I woke up, Lena wasn't there, but... She left me a note saying, Don't be worried. I went to the graveyard again to pay my respects to Iris. I know this sounds silly, but I wanted to say a little prayer. Don't sleep too long. Love, Lena. Not being a religious or superstitious man myself, I still thought that it was nice of Lena. I thought it was a really sweet idea, but might as well play it safe, right? I had breakfast, which was part of the hotel service, and decided to go meet Lena after. Maybe she was still at the cemetery. I didn't want to bother her, so I didn't call her. Taking the same route, I reached the cemetery. And there she was, sitting on Iris's tomb. <laughs> Hello, my dear. Did you say a prayer? I asked. Lena didn't answer. She just stared at me with an introspective and cautious look in her eyes. Hey, are you all right, Lena? After a couple of seconds, she finally smiled and said, Yeah, I'm all right. I'm just hungry. Uh, yeah, okay. Let's just go to the restaurant down the road uh, and we'll get a nice snack. I had breakfast about an hour ago, but walking through the fields has opened my appetite again, I answered. Lena held my arm the whole time as we walked to the restaurant, but she didn't say a word. But on the other hand... She was smiling a lot and observing me as if she was curious about me. I thought maybe she was just feeling spiritual or contemplative, so I smiled back. Throughout the rest of the day, Lena became a little more talkative, but she was acting different. Not in an unpleasant manner, though, but her fiery and spontaneous personalities seemed to have been replaced by a somewhat melancholy and shyish behavior. I assumed that the prayer at the cemetery might have had an effect on her. She'll be 
fine, I thought to myself. As we walked back to our hotel, I noticed something strange. She was wearing a black necklace that I had never seen before. Hey, Lena, where did you get that necklace? I asked. Oh, this? I bought it. <laughs> you found a store that sells something like that? Well, that's kind of cool. Can you take me there? Maybe they have something cool, like a Viking amulet or something. <laughs> you know Dublin was founded by Vikings, right? I said. I didn't visit a store. I saw an old lady selling necklaces and crosses at the nearby cemetery. I bought it from her, Lena answered. Oh, I see. Uh, well, it's really beautiful, I said, being sincere. The necklace had a triskel, which is also known as a Celtic spiritual symbol. That night, Lena and I made love. At first, my wife appeared very shy, but then, after the first few minutes, she took charge. She started to kiss me passionately and held me strongly. Too passionately and too strongly. She was actually biting my face and carving her nails into my body. And her necklace, which she didn't remove, was making me feel uncomfortable. Lena, stop! What are you doing? You're hurting me! I shouted. But she wouldn't let go, and I almost froze when she finally screamed. Stop calling me Lena! I'm Iris! My name is Iris! And you are my man. I returned to this world to have another chance. At first, I, I couldn't tell if Lena was just joking, but then I saw that the Triskel from her necklace was displaying an eerie, shining glow. And suddenly, I heard a whispering voice in my head. It sounded like Lena, the Lena that I knew and loved. It said, Remove the necklace from her. Destroy it. Save me, John. Without thinking twice, I did just that. It wasn't easy, but being a man, I was still stronger and able to do it. I smashed the Triskel. Lena screamed like a banshee and finally returned to her original self. John? I can, I can feel my own body again, she said with tears in her eyes. Lena, what happened? I asked as I hugged my wife. I, when I went to Iris's tombstone, the, there was this necklace on top of it. it. It was so beautiful and irresistible as if it wanted me to wear it. I couldn't resist and put the necklace around my neck, and I felt a horrifying sensation. I stopped feeling my own body, although my mind was still there, trapped inside, but not alone. I know it sounds crazy, but... I, I think the ghost of Iris took over me. Her spirit. It never left the cemetery. She died too young and wanted to experience more in this world. I think I could capture that from her thoughts, but I guess we gave her that opportunity. Lena started explaining. Well, I'm just glad it's over. Hopefully. Lena, let's get out of here. I agree, my wife replied. And this was my honeymoon in Ireland. I hope Iris finds her peace and crosses over. As for me and my wife, who we'll never underestimate cemeteries ever again. I tried to breathe deeply in and out, in and out. People say that helps you calm your nerves, but it really wasn't working for me. My husband, Sean, looked down at me from the edge of the hospital bed. He smiled. It's okay, he said. It's an outpatient procedure. People do it all the time. Yeah, I muttered. People, but not me. I'd never even considered getting a facelift until Sean brought it up. He had been so insistent. He even offered to pick the clinic and pay for everything himself. 
I always thought I looked good for my age, forehead creases and all, but it meant so much to Sean, and since he kept asking and asking, I just couldn't say no. That morning, I woke up nervous, but my feelings got even worse once I saw the place. Hospitals shouldn't be in warehouses like this. They shouldn't be on this side of town. Most of all, they should look cleaner than this place did, with its grimy brick walls and inescapable mildew scent. Something was very wrong here. Even the sheets themselves felt scratchy and in need of wash. Dr. Mixon comes highly recommended, Sean said. I told you that Sarah had some injections here and she came back very satisfied. I flinched. I hated when my husband brought up my sister. He knew that we didn't get along. He knew that I hated how he stayed in contact with my jealous twin. She was his ex, while I completely cut ties. But I guess his words helped. After all, if Dr. Mixon satisfied my sister's insistent vanity, then he had to be good, right? That was when the doctor walked in. The lower half of his face was covered by a surgical mask. All I could see of him were brushy eyebrows and dark eyes. His eyes locked onto me, unblinking and almost crazed. He didn't have the eyes of a surgeon. Then again, I, I was probably just letting my emotions get the best of me. He introduced himself and shook my hand. I didn't think doctors were supposed to do that right before surgery. Wasn't there some kind of sterilization protocol he had to follow? I tried to ask him about the procedure, but he ignored my questions and silently grabbed the plastic mask on the side of the bed. He placed it over my nose and mouth, and I started to breathe in the knockout gas. The last thought I had in my mind before it faded away was that the gas smelled wrong. After who knows how long, I came to. My eyes fluttered open, and the first thing I saw was Sean's smiling face. Honey, he said. The surgery was a complete success. I looked around, but the doctor wasn't in the room. I raised one shaky hand and touched my face, feeling a thick bandage around my cheeks. I was too woozy to say anything. Sean, still smiling, pulled me to my feet and led me out of the room. I wanted to argue with him. What about the doctor? What about my recovery time? But I couldn't say anything. Sean led me out of the building, into the dirty alley just outside, and we drove home. Sean took me straight to bed and told me to lie there to recover. For the next few days, he brought me food and gave me all kinds of words of encouragement. Then, my general achiness had changed into a strange feeling. My face was itchy, but not just itchy, it, it felt wrong, unnatural. I told Sean about it and he gave me some painkillers. In a way, the medication worked, but it made me loopy and lightheaded. I didn't have any pain. In fact, I didn't have any feeling at all. My face, my entire body, everything felt numb but the itching never went away. If anything, it intensified, as if a colony of bugs were hiding under my bandages, burrowing into my skin and eating away at my flesh. I stayed in bed, trying to sleep, but even though my entire body was tired, the sleep never came. Sean checked on me several times, and each time, I tried to explain that something was wrong, I needed to go back to the doctor. The first time I said that, he just smiled and told me, it's okay, just let the medication do its work. The second time, his smile disappeared and he told me to calm down. The third time, he screamed at me, called me ungrateful. I realized that if I wanted to make sure I was okay, I had to do it myself. When Sean was out of the room, I grabbed my wallet from the end table and found the scrap of paper I'd written down the clinic's phone number. I called, ready to whisper into the phone so that Sean wouldn't hear me. After two rings, a robot voice came on, saying that the phone number wasn't in service. I tried again and got the same result. Even with the numbing medications coursing through my blood, 
I felt my heart race. Something wasn't right. I pushed myself out of bed, using the wall to steady my balance. I trudged through the room and down the stairs. Sean was in the kitchen, talking and laughing to someone on the phone. He didn't hear me as I crossed through the living room and out the front door. I didn't even bother putting on shoes. For some reason, they weren't where I left them. My coat wasn't there either. I grabbed my car keys and hurried out. Still woozy, still barely able to see straight. I got in Sean's car and drove to the clinic on the outskirts of town. The whole time, I forced my hands to stay on the steering wheel. Otherwise, I'd be itching my face. When I pulled up to the clinic, my heart sank. The sign was gone. The windows were covered in plywood. The entire warehouse building was completely empty. No signs that any clinic had operated within. What was going on? I noticed a public restroom on the other side of the street. It looked filthy, but I didn't care. I got out of the car and ran inside. The place smelt like rot, and the mirrors were foggy and smudged. Standing in front of the clearest mirror they had, I peeled off my bandages and saw what was underneath. As soon as I did, I retched horribly to the stained sink. My face was horrific. It seemed like scars had purposely been carved into my cheeks, stitched together in a way that twisted my skin into irregular lumps. Dark bruises jutted out of my jawline. This wasn't a facelift in recovery. This was a purposeful mangling. I should have gone straight to the hospital, a real hospital, but instead, I got in my car and drove straight home. I needed answers. As soon as I pushed through the front door, I saw Sean wasn't alone. He was standing with Sarah, my sister, the woman who looked exactly like me, or who used to look exactly like me. They were holding each other. They both turned to look when I burst in. Honey, Sean told Sarah, it looks like we have a guest. What did you do to me? I screamed. Sean laughed, and Sarah, still looking at me. You did a great job, honey, she said. Now, I'll always be the pretty one. My name is Thomas, and I'm 25 years old. A few months back, I got a job at McDonald's. I already had a day job as a restaurant waiter, but I needed more money, since I wanted to get my own apartment and move out of my parents' house, finally. Ironically, during the day, I was a waiter at a top chef restaurant, which served exquisite and exclusive fresh cuisine. The food there was very expensive. Unfortunately, Waiters weren't paid proportionally. Above average, but still not enough. All due respect towards you other commoners who can't afford anything beyond Big Macs, double cheeseburgers, and chicken nuggets. In any case, I wasn't going to work at McDonald's every day. Well, in fact, I wasn't going to work during the days at all, since I was taking the night shifts. Most of the time, I was taking orders from people who were using the drive through service, being served in the comfort of their own cars. The first weeks went by and overall it wasn't anything that I wasn't expecting. Even during the nighttime, I knew I had to attend a generous amount of customers. A few of them were sketchy, verbally aggressive and menacing, while others were visibly drunk, which is the last thing you should be when driving a car, but I would say 60% of the people were easygoing and nice to serve. After a couple months, I got a customer that was definitely particular. It was a woman, maybe in her late 40s. She was good looking with big blue eyes. She had a big smile on her face, short blonde hair. The woman was very nice and talkative. She even gave me a tip, which is not common to be honest. She simply ordered a cheeseburger, a Coke, 
and a small bag of fries. So far, nothing weird about this. The thing is, the woman returned exactly one week later, but this time, she looked very different, including her attitude. She was dressed like a gothic woman, including her makeup. She had skull-shaped earrings and a creepy look in her eyes, and a general cold and eerie expression on her face. It was like she was analyzing me and seeing me for the first time. Although I can't say she was rude, I was genuinely freaked out by her. This time, she doubled her previous order. Two cheeseburgers, two Cokes, and two small bags of fries. And no thank you and no tip. A few days later, as my McDonald's night shift came to an end, I was tired and anxious to get in my car and drive back home. The parking lot was almost empty, except for two cars, one being mine. But there were two individuals there, precisely right next to my vehicle. Uh, hello? Uh, can, can I help you? I asked, a bit nervous as I approached them. Yes, mister. You most certainly can, a woman said. I was very surprised to see the same mysterious woman. As I looked over at the other figure, I almost froze when I saw it was the same woman, meaning there were two of them. They had to be twins, of course. The one who was speaking to me was the nice, smiling woman, and the other, who was silent, was the gothic woman. Um, what do you need help with? Um, it's kind of late, I asked, trying to avoid showing my insecurity. Just look into my eyes, the smiling woman said as she came closer to me. The woman started whispering some words. For some strange reason, I couldn't stop looking at her big, bright eyes. I started to feel numb and then sleepy and then I simply lost consciousness. When I woke up, I was tied up and lying on the floor. I think I was probably at their house. Irina, he woke up. The gothic woman was staring at me, sitting on a chair. Ah, excellent. Hello, Thomas. The smiling twin approached and was now speaking to me as if I was her best friend. W what is this? What do you want, money? Take anything you need, just don't hurt me, I said. Ah, unfortunately, my good Thomas, our interests are exactly the opposite. We don't want money. We want to take your life, she answered. What? Why? I screamed. My name is Irina, and this is my twin sister, Olga. We symbolize the different bipolar planes of existence, I represent order, light, and life, and Olga stands for chaos, darkness, and death. We seldom meet, and as you would expect, we don't get along very well. But once a year, there's a common ritual that we share, which serves both of our antagonist causes and different paths. The smiling woman said, being enigmatic and vague. I think you both need fucking therapy. Just let me go, please. I, I won't say anything. I shouted. You will be set free soon enough. How does the order and chaos meet? By taking a life. Because life itself needs death in order to progress in time and space. So we are going to kill you, Thomas. And then... We will mix your flesh with the hamburger meat. You understand the sacred meaning of this, right? The cycle of life and death? Your flesh will be feeding hundreds of homeless human beings, hence contributing to the existence of their lives. While at the same time, you will free the world of your own life. Irina's explanation was insane. You're crazy. Let me out! Help! I started to scream like a maniac. Just a few more moments, Thomas. Embrace your place in the wonderful circle of life. 
Olga is coming with a knife, Irina said. I could feel my heart beating inside my chest. I couldn't listen to my own breathing. I wasn't even shouting anymore. I saw Olga, the gothic sister, come closer with knife in hand. But then, the unexpected happened. Olga stabbed Irina in the throat. Irina's big eyes were as surprised as mine as she looked towards her sister. Olga spoke. I'm so sorry, my sister. Our partnership is over. Tonight, chaos wins and rules alone. And you have to admit, you didn't see this one coming, did you? That's why I always win. Irina fell and died within a few minutes. Before leaving, Olga whispered to me, You were saved by chaos. Never forget this. Goodbye. Then the gothic sister left. The next day I was found by my colleagues and they called the cops. I told them what happened and repeated my story to the police. Olga was never found. I guess she was right. Chaos always wins. The first time I saw a circus, I was six years old. I'd gone with my father to the fair, and it had been one of the best days of my life because my father passed away a few days later. It was my fondest memory of our relationship, too, because he had been so warm and affectionate with me at the circus when I'd been overwhelmed by the awesome things that were on display. I could tell a few people at the fair were familiar with him because when the show was over, he'd eagerly gone over to one of the performers, the magician, and they discussed with flourish. I could not easily forget the magician because he had a strange smile due to a gash on the lower part of his face. Sometimes I still get a twinge in my chest because I feel like I can perceive his scent from that day. My father was always particular about those things. He wore only cotton shirts and a particular type of pants. He had a very fancy gold Rolex watch he got from the fair and it never left his wrist. But after his death, that watch went missing from his belongings. And now, it was this watch that had me curious when the small miracle of a Craigslist offering appeared on my screen for a fancy gold watch that sunny Saturday. I assumed it was awfully similar to the watch which my dad owned, but I had nothing to reference the watch by, so I quickly sent a message to the seller. They replied in minutes, and I could tell he tried his best to make a salesman type of charm with me. I went with it with keen attention drawn to this watch by a power which was beyond me. I chalked up to the fact that it reminded me so much of my father. The seller made his price known, and it was a steep call from what he had stated on the site. I asked why it was so, and he claimed to have only dropped the price to court interest that no one had ever wanted the watch up until I came along. I thought that was an interesting reason, even though I couldn't shake the awry feeling. Hey, I typed at him. I'd like to get the watch, and I'll pay your sum. I noted his hesitation at first because our exchange had been fluid up until that stage. I was anxious. Seconds passed with the heavy hand of an eternity as I watched the screen. The harder I stared at the watch, the clearer it became to me that it should belong to me. He told me that he could have it delivered to me personally, if I did not mind, as it was surprising to him that someone would want such an old watch for that sum. I didn't mind and agreed. We talked about the time of his arrival. Hours passed since my conversation with the seller, and I was reminded by the blaring alarm which I had set for the moment of his arrival. I rushed from my workstation, a small part of my house, to the clock to turn it off when a light rapping noise echoed on my door. I paused in my track and heaved to clear my foggy mind from the lumbering progression of thought. Who's there? I asked as I walked gingerly towards the door. Hey, delivery! The voice, clearly old and male, replied. Shit. I cussed under my breath as I sauntered through the room to the door. I turned the key on the lock backwards and pulled it open. The door yawned open enough for me to stick my head through. 
A familiar, rushing scent wound into my nostril, and I recoiled. The man's face changed from a beaming smile to a look of concern when he noted my reaction. Are you okay? He asked when I stared at him in confusion, unable to place the scent still. I nodded gently, assessing him guardedly. A clean strip of cold sweat pooled around my neck, and I struggled with the zipping and unzipping sensation of my chest. It had been years since I'd felt that, and I wondered if it was worth getting the watch back. You wanted the watch? The man asked with a stern expression. Yes, please. How would you like to be paid? Cash or online? I quizzed, dizzy from the rush of my mind. He paused and stared at me. I'm not sure it's safe to collect such a sum of cash from you, and I'm not quite familiar with these new online payment systems. I stopped and wondered why he would come all that way just to deliver his wristwatch without knowing how he would like to be paid. My sense of concern was aroused. How about I think of a way to take payment from you and I'll be back in a few days, he said, and stared down at his pocket before he could fully flash a smile. He retrieved his hands from his pocket and the watch came out with it. I was overcome with a cold sweat as he looked up and that familiar smile from years ago registered in my head. I was stunned silent as I visually trailed the scar on the lower part of his face which made his smiling awkward. I swallowed a harsh, nervous air which was at the back of my throat. How did you get this watch, sir? I asked. Pardon me? He queried back. He was no longer smiling. He had a wicked grimace which betrayed his ready inclination to harm me. I did not care. My father once owned this watch, I clarified as I stood by the door, heart racing as he turned around to reveal his eyes. First, the pair of pupils were blue, and then they were red, and then green as he blinked and walked towards me. My respiration intensified as the meaning of all of it dawned on me. I was standing before the man who had stabbed my father all those years ago, and he'd hypnotized me now. I felt my muscles slacken as he moved closer to me, and I started to wobble backwards from the door. With my strongest effort to break from his hypnosis, I moved back and slammed the door shut. I shook my head and I was once again in control of myself. Seems as though I'd have to collect everything now rather than later. <laughs> he snickered viciously as he pried the door open with a forceful yank. I had no means of escape, so I did what I had to and leapt on him, dashing out a striking blow with my fist which connected with his throat. He choked and gasped for air, pleading. I assume someone's already paid you, I shouted. He struggled through wheezing. Damn, I should have known that I can't sell the same watch to a family twice. With those last words, he shut his eyes. And I stood there, shaking with panic and wondering what had just happened. Years ago, as I was sitting in a waiting room, I had come to the conclusion that I wanted to change my body's appearance. I was young, and I was surely not ready to encounter what I had. As I sat and waited, there was a girl who went ahead of me. I sat there twiddling my fingers as my nerves set in. I was young and really wanted to fit in, so plastic surgery was what I wanted to do. I had watched how confident other girls who had gone under the knife were. Claire Montgomery? I heard the woman call my name, and as creepy as it was, I walked with her. But had I known then what I know now, I would have turned around and never went back. As I walked with the nurse through the double doors, the scenery changed. It wasn't so welcoming, and really made me think that I was making a mistake. I passed by all the rooms that had people in it, and every one of them said ICU recovery. I looked over at the nurse walking me down what felt like the longest hallway and she half smiled at me. It made me feel quite uneasy, I won't lie. Every nerve in my body was trying to pull me back out, but I knew this is what I wanted to do. Finally, we made it to the room. She sat me down and examined me. 
I apologized to her because I was extremely nervous. She looked at me and said, You should be! Those words should have been my red flag telling me that I needed to get out of there. The nurse didn't give off nice vibes, so it made everything that much worse. She did her duties and went on her way. As she left, she said the doctor will be in shortly. I sat there contemplating everything. I was looking around the room and it was dark and gloomy. There were tools still in the packaging, but it wasn't something that I wanted to look at. The posters on the wall were cartoons of botched Barbies. Maybe it was meant to scare people away, I thought. Looking over at the door, waiting for it to open, I could hear people outside. I thought it was the doctor, but soon I realized it was the nurse and someone else talking. I couldn't really make out what they were saying, but they were talking about the girl that went before me. Shortly after that, the doctor came in. He had gloves that had a good amount of blood on them. He properly took them off and disposed of them, and apologized, saying there were some difficulties that happened in his last surgery. I didn't really know what to say, so I just told him it was okay. He sat me down and was reading through the papers for me to sign to make sure that everything was good for me to start the procedure. Soon enough, I had signed all the papers and he gave me a gown to dress into. He explained how the whole thing was going to work and that the nurse was going to take me down to the surgery room. I got dressed into the stained gown and waited for the nurse. She came in with a cup of water and some medicine that she explained was for the surgery. I would have to wait 20 minutes before having the surgery to let the medicine kick in. She wheeled me down the hall in a chair and my vision started to get foggy. I wasn't sure if that was okay, so I asked her if it was. She looked at me and nodded her head. I felt like I was on a boat and the walls were moving like the waves in the ocean. We got onto the elevator and I remember looking up at the lights. Once it stopped, she wheeled me into a dingy room. There was a light in the corner and a bed in a sitting position. She wheeled me over there and helped me up to sit. I remember thinking that the whole setup looked like a scene straight from a horror movie. I was still feeling dizzy and nauseous. The nurse told me that she had to strap me into the bed so there wasn't a chance that I would fall out. I wasn't even in the right mind to ask her anything. I was just looking around trying to make out what was around me. There were other rooms but the lights were off. I could hear moaning like someone was in pain but I couldn't tell what it was. The nurse walked over and closed the pool shade to give me privacy. I thanked her as I asked what her name was and she replied, Rose. I'm Nurse Rose. I thanked her again and the rest is a blur. I remember waking up to a scream and things being flipped over. There was someone saying, stay away from me. I, I was scared. It sounded like something terrible was happening. I, I tried to get up but realized I was strapped into the bed. I looked over and noticed that I had an IV in my arm and was frightened because I knew I wasn't awake for that. I kept trying to remember if someone came in and put it in, but I just couldn't remember. I started to look around the room and saw a white board that had my name on it and the nurse Rose and Dr. Reed. I tried to say something but nothing would come out. I could feel my lips really chapped like they were sliced. I heard a big bang and the screaming stopped. I could hear the nurse and the doctor saying, lift her here and we will strap her in. I was trying to understand what was going on. Maybe it was the medication that I was on making me hallucinate or I was dreaming. I don't know, but it just didn't seem right. If I could, I would have left right then and there. I was laying there for a good moment and Nurse Rose came in. She said, oh, you're awake. I'll go get you some more medicine. Then she walked out and the doctor came in. He looked at me and smiled and asked if I was ready for my surgery. I thought to myself that all this for a nose job? That seemed a bit too much. But I wasn't a doctor and I really had no idea what was about to happen. Rose walked in and stuck a needle right into my IV port. I could feel the warmth of it going through my veins. The doctor walked over and placed what looked like a face into a bowl right next to me. Dr. Reed looked at me and said, Don't worry, you won't feel a thing. All I remember was closing my eyes and waking up to agonizing pain all over my face. I looked around trying to clear my foggy eyes. 
what I saw was my own face lying in a bowl. I, I could hardly keep it together. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't. I struggled to get my hands free of the restraints, but managed to get them out. Finally, I was able to make my way to the edge of the bed, and I stood up onto the floor that was cold on my bare feet. I walked over to the curtain, moved it, and stopped dead in my tracks when I saw what was behind that curtain. The girl that went before me was tied to a chair. The scene was so gruesome, I couldn't bear to look at it. I ran past her and tried to find a door, stumbling wall to wall. I, I came across another curtain that led to a room filled with jars of body parts. I took in my surroundings and saw a door. As I was walking towards it, I could hear the elevator. I, I began to panic. I stumbled to the door and opened it. It sounded an alarm and I knew I had to act fast, so I hid behind a table. I could hear shouting and the doctor and the nurse were running towards the door. They both locked out the door, thinking that I had escaped, so they both ran back to the elevator. Then I escaped via the stairwell. The sun was bright and it made it hard for me to see. I walked towards the parking lot and a woman grabbed me. She was in pure shock. All I could say was, hospital. She walked me to her vehicle and sat me in the back. And she drove me to the hospital. I began to cry because I caught a glimpse of what I looked like in the reflection of the window. And it, it wasn't my face. I was so scared. Everyone turned and looked at me and immediately took me to the emergency room. I was still weak, but the adrenaline I had was the only thing that was helping me at this point. A nurse came in to ask what happened and I told her the whole story. She was shocked and didn't know what to say. As I was getting treated for the bleeding on my face, a couple of officers walked in. There were a lot of people in the room and I needed all of them to listen to me. I narrated the whole ordeal to them. Shortly after I had completed, I started to feel the pain all over my face, and I was really tired. A senior doctor came in and told me that they would need to keep me under watch for a few days and do some procedures which would stop the bleeding and minimize scarring. But the doctor warned me that the chances of my face being permanently scarred due to the botched up job was extremely high, and all they would try to do would be to minimize the damage. I was helpless at this point, but nodded in affirmation. The nurse gave me medicine and put something on my face that helped with the pain. Everything after that was a blur. I, I fell asleep and woke up from a nightmare. I was still in the hospital. I pressed the panic button on the remote and the nurse came rushing in. The truth is, I was scared to be alone and wanted someone to be with me. One kind nurse agreed to sit and keep me company. I stayed there overnight and waited for the officers to come back. After a long morning of pain, the officers dropped in to tell me that they went to the address that I gave them but found nothing. They didn't find the jars of body parts or the girl in the chair that I claimed was almost dead. The building was empty except for some old furniture here and there. I was discharged a fortnight later. The bleeding was gone and the pain had subsided, but it's been a year since the incident and the scars are still there. I consulted multiple reputable clinics in the state, but all of them quoted a sky-high price for the plastic surgery of my face. Now I am left with the only option, to fly down to Turkey and undergo the procedure there. I have heard some positive reviews, but also a lot of horror stories from Turkey. My friend, please tell me. If you were in a situation like mine, what would you have done? Ta-da! Brad pulled his hands away from my eyes and I got my first view of the place. Wow, I said, careful to make sure my voice sounded enthusiastic. I didn't want my husband to hear any of the disappointment I was feeling. The place was big, as he's told me but it was also run down and filthy. The paint was peeling and half of the shutters had fallen off. The whole place looked sad, broken. 
This was not where I wanted to spend the rest of my life. I knew Brad had called it a fixer-upper, but that was an understatement. This place should be bulldozed. So you like it? He asked. I love it. I knew how he wanted me to react, and I knew how much this moment meant to him. Together we walked over the dead grass, up the broken porch steps, and into a house that genuinely made me want to recoil. The inside was just as bad as the outside, with missing tiles on the floor and a musty, acrid smell throughout, as if something had died in the walls. This was our new house, but the only thing new about it were the flies that had come in with us. And that was how Brad and I moved into the house on Cherry Street. We unpacked our boxes the same day, and Brad went to work the day after, leaving me alone with the dust and frustration. For the first week, I spent nearly all of my waking hours cleaning off surfaces and making a list of everything that needed to be replaced. I woke up, got to work, and then ended my day with a lukewarm shower in brownish water. Every day, Brad would come home from the office stressed from his new job and ask me how my day went. I always bottled up my sadness and told him that I was just fine, that I loved the house he'd picked for us. The days were terrible, but the nights were even worse. After the sun dipped over the mountains behind us, the house began to make noises, creaks and groans and all sorts of unidentifiable sounds that Brad euphemistically called settling. The house was settling. We were too. On those long nights while Brad snored away, I lay in bed and tried to ignore the noises around me. I took Ambien, more than I should have, and that worked for a while, but after about a week I couldn't sleep at all. The noises were getting worse. They were changing too. What started out as minor creaks and groans morphed into louder noises, banging, thugs, worst of all, whispering. At first I thought it was all in my sleep-deprived head, but I knew I wasn't crazy. There was actual whispering coming from the walls, <laughs> unintelligible voices that were sometimes punctuated by giggles. <laughs> Several times I woke up Brad from his deep sleep, but as soon as I did, the whispering stopped. It was as if the house wanted to terrorize me and me alone. Each time he got increasingly annoyed as if I was finding unnecessary flaws with this perfect home. After a few nights of this, I gave up completely. He'd never hear the voices, and he'd never believe me. After two weeks of sleep deprivation and near constant fear, I'd had enough. The whispering had grown even louder, the voices more confident. I had to figure this out for myself. I pushed myself out of bed, careful not to awaken my husband and elicit even more anger. I crept out of the room and into the long, dark hallway. Aside from the creaking floorboards under my bare feet, I had to be silent. I had to listen to the whispers to see where they were coming from. I passed the bathroom, with its dripping shower nozzle plinking to the rhythm of my heartbeat. I passed the guest bedroom, deathly quiet, and then the living room. When I made it to the kitchen, I knew I'd found the source of the whispering. I was close enough and the voice was loud enough for me to make out individual words. They sad remove the wife. <laughs> These voices were talking about my husband and me. They were laughing too, coldly, mockingly. I pushed open the kitchen door, expecting to find nothing on the other side. After all, these were just voices. They didn't have a physical presence. The kitchen's windows were all covered, so it took a second for my eyes to adjust to the darkness. But when they did, I gasped in horror. There, crouched near the table, were two figures. One was male and the other female. They were bent low, tearing apart a loaf of bread that sat on the floor between them. They noticed me right away. I couldn't see their faces in the dark, but I saw them turn their heads and look at me. I was too scared to move, too scared to flee for my life. The figures didn't move for a long moment, just waiting in the dark, until the man whispered something to the woman. The woman whispered back. It was some kind of disagreement between them. Then the man stood up, thin and frail but impossibly tall. 
He walked towards me, and before my frozen body could react, he grabbed my shoulders and lowered his face until it was inches from mine. This is a nightmare, he whispered. You're asleep. And then he pushed me backwards, out of the kitchen. He slammed the door behind him. That was when I screamed. I guess it had taken that long for my senses to come back to me. I screamed louder than I ever had before, and in seconds, Brad ran to me from the bedroom. What's wrong? He asked. I, I couldn't form words. No sounds would leave my mouth. All I could do was point one shaky finger towards the kitchen door. He angrily pushed it open and charged into the kitchen. I wanted to stop him, but I just couldn't. Then he called my name. Teresa! Come here now! I held my breath and followed him into the dark room. He clicked on the light and the kitchen was completely empty. By then, my throbbing heartbeat had slowed and I was able to speak. People, I said, there were, there were people in here. He spread his arms out wide and gestured all around him. Yeah, well, they're not here now. Jesus Christ, Teresa, do you hate our new house so much that you have to ruin my sleep with some hallucination? And he was right. There were no intruders there. I looked at the floor where the figures had been crouching. Brad, I said, look at the crumbs. The tiles were speckled with breadcrumbs. So, you must have missed a spot when you were sweeping. Finally, I snapped. I was done being scared. I was done hiding my emotions. I hate this house, Brad! I shouted. It was the first time I had ever shouted at my husband. It's terrible, and there are, there are things here, and I'm tired of you pretending that everything is perfect. It's not, and I want us to move out right now! <laughs> Before Brad could answer, I heard a giggle coming from the half-open pantry. Fear ate away at my anger, and my beating heart was now filled with a mixture of both fear and anger. Brad's expression softened. I realized that he heard it too. Finally, he started walking towards the pantry. D don't, I told him. He ignored me and pulled open the pantry and clicked on the light. I carefully stepped forward, feeling the bits of breadcrumbs under my bare feet. I looked over Brad's shoulder into the pantry, but it was empty. Just shelves of spices and canned food. My heart sank, and then Brad leaned forward and pushed some of the cans to the side, revealing a small opening in the wall behind the shelves. I'd never seen that before, even though it was big enough for a full-grown adult to crawl through. He leaned his face toward the opening and shouted, Whoever you are, get out here now! Inside the darkness, there was some rustling and silence. Then slowly... Very slowly, the man and woman crawled into the light. They were covered in dust, their clothes torn and ragged, and they smelled like mold, like filth. I glanced at Brad to make sure he saw what I saw, and he did. He glared at the intruders. Who are you? He asked. The man answered. The bank took everything away, but we couldn't leave. This house is ours. You... You've been living in the walls? I asked. The woman looked away. The man's dark eyes locked onto me. He stared me down. This is our house, he said again. Brad told me to get my phone and call the police. Then he turned back towards the couple and screamed at them. We bought this fair and square. If you don't leave us alone, we're going to... I interrupted my husband. No, I said. I'm done. I turned and walked straight out of the front door. I got in my car and drove to a hotel. The house on Cherry Street was ours. It was what Brad had chosen for us. But I refused to set foot in it ever again. I'd finally had enough. My name's Arthur and I'm 21 years old. Last year I got into the university to study architecture. Since my parents made a decent living and I was the only child, they asked me if I wanted to rent an apartment. Of course! It's a lot better than sharing a room with someone, I said. Yes, but we've checked out the prices in the area. You'll have to share the flat with someone else, my father explained. Well, still a better alternative. As long as I find a person with whom I get along and we establish a few basic ground rules, I think it'll be fine, I said. And so, it was settled. 
After a month, I met a guy named Brian. He was from my university, but was studying something else related to ancient history and religions. I have to admit, it's not something that fascinates me that much, although I know it's a field that is becoming more and more popular, even in mainstream and social media. Brian was cool, very peaceful, but always up for a good conversation. He smiled often and had an optimistic and easygoing character. Sometimes we spoke about what he liked, other times about my own preferences. We discussed a lot of things, music, movies, whatnot. We didn't have a lot in common, but it didn't matter to me. I felt comfortable around Brian, and we were simply sharing a flat. The two of us scanned for apartments relatively close to the university, and eventually found a flat that was excellent. Two bedrooms, one bathroom, the kitchen, and one decent living room. The kitchen wasn't too big, but the rest was perfectly fine. The price was also very appealing. During the first couple of weeks, everything was normal. Let's put it that way. Me and Brian had our own routines and schedules. Sometimes we'd eat together and watch a movie in the living room, but now and then we wouldn't even meet. We also had different friends. So every time Brian, or me, wanted to have some people over, we'd discuss that. Okay, so tomorrow you're going to have your friends over. It's a deal. I'll stay clear from the living room and the kitchen as well. I'll just eat something outside, I said to Brian, the first time he asked if he could invite his friends. Arthur, you're very welcome to join us. Maybe you'll find it interesting. In any case, for sure you can use the kitchen. No ceremonies, no problems. It's up to you, Brian said. Well, I will say hello at least, since I'll be back home to sleep. I can't make it too late. I actually have to work on an assignment. I'm glad our bedrooms are big enough. They're perfect to study and to sleep. I wish I had a girlfriend too, eh? I said, trying to be funny. Oh, Arthur, there are so many more things to discover that'll bring you happiness. Girlfriends are basically mundane things. That's just something to keep you away from the real truth and meaning of life. Brian's answer was mysterious, and the first time I found him enigmatic, to say the least. <laughs> if you say so, Brian, I'm sorry. But as you know, philosophy and religion aren't exactly my cup of tea. Yeah, I'm aware that's your thing, and we can talk about that sometime, but not right now, I replied. Of course, maybe later then. See you, Arthur. Take care, Brian, have a good time. And so we departed, as this conversation took place in a coffee shop near our university. Following my own advice, I had dinner in an Italian restaurant and took my time before returning home. I was hoping that Brian's friends would be gone by then. But that wasn't the case. It was almost midnight when I returned to my flat, our flat, and Brian's gathering was still happening in the living room. Now, besides Brian, there were two other individuals with him. One of them was clearly in his late fifties, and the other one was an old woman way beyond fifty. I was freaked out, because Brian and his two weird friends were dressed in even weirder clothes. Pink robes and also pink hats, like those of monks. But even more bizarre was the fact that they had a pink spot on their foreheads, made with some kind of cheap ink. Still, I tried to be polite. Um. Hello, everyone. Good evening, I greeted as I entered the living room. Ah, oh, Arthur, hello. Please meet my friends Markon and Lucy, Brian said as I shook everyone's hands. Uh, nice to meet you both, I replied. I'm sure you're feeling awkward because of our clothes. I'll explain. Through our research, we have discovered what we call the third way of life. You know, Arthur, every person has a spiritual third eye right here inside our foreheads. This is why we painted ourselves. And the third eye is what allows us to see the reality as it is, beyond the dream and the illusion that are our normal lives. We want to find truth and cosmic liberation. Why don't you have a seat, Arthur? We can also set you free, Brian said. Uh, not really. I'm, I'm off to bed. I'm very sleepy. Maybe another time, I replied, feeling very uncomfortable. Okay, Arthur. Sleep tight. You too, Brian. Nice to meet you, uh, Macron and Lucy. I departed. I was, in fact, very tired, so I didn't have much time to think about all that. There are all sorts of religions these days. The internet and mass media has made everything and everyone look normal, I guess. So I decided not to worry about Brian's 
third way of life shit. As I fell asleep, I had, however, a disturbing dream. Brian was shooting his two friends, Macron and Lucy, in their foreheads using a gun. And then he came to my bedroom and did the same to me. I woke up in a panic. Ugh, <sighs> damn nightmare, I said to myself. Yes, life is a nightmare. But I'm here to set you free, my friend, said Brian. He was there inside my bedroom with a gun pointed at my forehead. Brian, don't do anything stupid, please, I pleaded. It's not stupid, my friend. Stupid is to live the lie. I'll set you free, and then I'll do the same with me. Macron and Lucy are already in the real world. I threw my pillow against Brian's gun, which was enough to distract him. I ran away from my bedroom and from the apartment. I was still able to hear a gunshot, and Brian screaming for my name. But fear made me run faster. I went directly to the police and reported the situation. When the police arrived, they saw Macron and Lucy dead. They were shot precisely in their foreheads. As for Brian, he took his own life through the same process. This was my traumatizing experience with my crazy flatmate, Brian. I moved out of that house because of recurring nightmares and trauma. I took a part-time job to distract myself and shifted to a smaller, one-bedroom apartment. But sometimes I still have nightmares about Brian. He calls for me to join him and his friends. They appear far, but at peace. I have no idea how to get rid of these crazy, stupid dreams. My name is Wes, and I'm 46 years old. I'm married to my wonderful wife, Dorothy, for a decade now. We have a seven-year-old son, Wyatt. I'm a hard-working man, but I don't like doing the same stuff all the time. So I keep changing my jobs every two years or so. I like to say that my career consists of variety and learning. And I've had very well-paid jobs, too. Such was the case last year. I was hired to be a security guard in a warehouse. The place was huge, and I was the only guard doing the night shift. Those were the hours which brought in the good bucks, and I enjoyed the peace and quiet. I'm a big, strong guy, too, so I have been a security guard before in nightclubs and handled some complicated and violent situations. But in the warehouse, which was locked, I assumed I wouldn't be having any problems. The facility had many rooms, some of them which were locked. The place was used to keep technological devices, which were packed into boxes. There were also vehicles, like trucks and even a couple of helicopters. Some of them were marked as belonging to the U.S. government. I assumed the company who owned the warehouse had contact with the government. This was extremely interesting, at least for the first couple of weeks. Then, of course, I got used to walking around those walls and checking out the security cameras. But I'm not someone who gets bored easily. I was glad because it wasn't a stressful job. As days went by, I had absolutely nothing to report. <laughs> Fine by me. Being almost 50, peace and quiet had a bigger place in my life than adrenaline and dangerous stories to tell. One night, though, as I was wandering around the warehouse, I heard glass being broken. The noise was very distant and muffled. But since I was used to doing so many hours in complete silence, my hearing had become more acute. I followed the noise, which led me to a wall. But I could hear something, or someone, inside the wall, which was obviously a room. I could listen and hear deep breathing and other weird vocal sounds. These were my thoughts. Someone is trapped in here. And this warehouse is probably being used by some kind of mafia. The government vehicles could have been bought in the black market for all I know. 
God, there could be so much corruption going on here. Now, I was left with a dilemma. What do I do? Being a man who was always looking to try out new things, not only jobs, fear was not really something that bothered me. I decided to try to free that man or woman. The guys from the warehouse had no idea where I lived. I was actually being paid with physical money, no documents attached, another red flag. I had more than one phone number, and they only had my professional one. Same logic with my emails. It would be easy to get rid of those and get new ones. This to say, after playing the hero and getting away from the warehouse, they wouldn't be able to track me so easily. At least, that's what I had hoped. I tried finding a door, which would lead to that mysterious and hidden room. Eventually, I did find my way after walking through a very small corridor. The door was locked, but fortunately, there were several iron objects around that I could use to break the lock. And so I did. I was completely astonished as soon as I saw the nature of the room. It was big, gray, and all devices and items indicated that it was some kind of laboratory. I noticed there was a small bathroom as well, and a bed. A man was there, very scared, trying to hide from me under the bed. He was dressed in a blue robe, as if he was a medical patient. Please, don't hurt me, he said in a very feeble voice. His head was shaved. Hey, uh, don't worry. I'm, I'm not here to hurt you. Uh, in fact, I'm here to try to help you. It seems as though you're being kept here against your will. Am I right? I asked. Yes. Why do they have you in here? Look at my right arm and hand, he said. As he showed me the part of the body, I was shocked. His arm and hands were not human. They had green scales like a reptile. What happened to you? I asked. I was taken against my will. Someone was experimenting on me, producing genetic alterations in my body. He answered. Who? Why? I don't know. But they're probably working with some kind of shadow agency which belonged to the government. They don't talk to me much about it but I could hear a few things when they thought I was asleep. Scientists always have sick fantasies regarding genetic experiments. Super soldiers, pure races, half-breed creatures. It's terrifying. Uh, okay, I'm going to take you with me, to your family. Come on now, I said. My family's a part of this. They sold me to this group. He said, No, unbelievable. Well, you can come home with me for now, I said. Thank you. Thank you. My, my name is Ronald. All right, I'm Wes. Come on, let's go. I had to help the man. He was very weak. Fortunately, there was no one there. I took him to my car and we drove like hell from that sick warehouse. I explained the situation to my wife. She was obviously horrified. Fortunately, it was easy to hide Ronald's deformed and reptilian arms and hands. So we just told our son that he was a friend who was visiting. I immediately destroyed my professional cell phone, along with its number, and deleted the email that the warehouse agency knew of. Do you want to go public and tell the press what happened to you? I asked Ronald. No, please, no. They will get me. Someone will. And I will never be left alone. A circus freak that everyone would fear or laugh at. Look at me. There's no turning back from this. I guess the arms could be removed, but I wouldn't trust anyone to put me to sleep in order to perform such a surgery, Ronald explained. I agreed. I now had to decide with my wife, and also with my bizarre guest, 
What should we do with him? As I mentioned before, his arm wasn't that hard to hide. My wife and I decided we were going to help him get a new life, somewhere. Unfortunately, one week later, Ronald died. But at least he died in peace. He was already feeling better, at least psychologically speaking and he was even smiling once more. Ironically, I assumed that the scientists were giving him some kind of substance, because Ronald said that they injected him regularly with something. I guess we'll never know. I took Ronald's body to some woods and buried it. As for me and my family, we moved. We're not even living in the United States anymore, so I think we're safe. But I can't stop wondering how many people are out there suffering at the hands of such shadow agencies, and who's really behind it all. Many students across the years at my school have often spread rumors about weird teachers. Well, the truth is that most of them were completely harmless. But having an odd stare, a freaky smile, or even talking to the wrong student was enough to have them deemed as creepy by the cohort of students at my school. They were usually just a select few who would pretty much gossip about anyone and everyone. But when it came to teachers, huh, they didn't hold back. There had even been cases of teachers getting fired because of the rumors. Teachers who my older brother had been taught by years ago, saying they were some of the most wonderful people he had ever met. Or so they had appeared. The problem with repeatedly getting teachers fired without reason was that when a teacher joined the school who had actual issues, the school would likely ignore any further complaints about them, believing all the students to be spreading more rumors just for the sake of getting the teachers fired. This exact problem had happened to my year. A year that had only just escaped from lockdown and we were returning to a school we'd never been in before, yet we'd been a part of it for a full academic year now. We were far too naive to be able to distinguish between teachers, which made identifying them difficult, making the first few weeks back a struggle. But after a while, we became used to them, and them to us. And in one case in particular, far too close. Morning, everybody. My English teacher, Miss Hart, a woman of around 27 years of age, only a few years out of uni and fresh out of teacher training, was doing her usual morning greeting. Morning, Miss, we all shouted back. There was a general clamor of excitement, as Miss had told us the day before that we were getting a new assistant to replace the old one which had left due to his son getting cancer. A horrific situation for such a kind man that he had been to us. Our new teaching assistant arrives today. Are you all excited? Her cheerful tone delighted the class, and our faces twisted into smiles of joy as we all cocked our heads towards the door, ready to see the new T.A., as we turned around to face the door, there were a couple of shocked gasps as many snapped their necks away from the door to face a man, sat at a desk in the far right, his glass tinted with the blue light flashing from his screen. He noticed us all looking at him immediately and lifted his head up to sink with his eyes. He bore no expression of a smile as he looked around the room, until his eyes fell on me. His solemn face suddenly morphed into a rather sadistic smile that stabbed into me like one tectonic needle piercing through my heart. Good morning. I look forward to working closely with you. Even Miss Hart was slightly creeped out by his estranged movement and seismic glare as he seemed to be directing his words only towards me. I was petrified. And it wasn't long before the terror escalated and Mr. Hollard grew near. Morning, Harry. How'd you sleep last night? It had been around five days since his appearance in the classroom, and since then he had consistently sat as close as he could to me in every lesson. With many lessons that came after break being sat down next to my seat, cutting me off from my friends, leaving me no choice but to sit next to him. He would plague me at first with questions about how I found the school, but then soon enough those questions began devolving into far more personal ones. It was good, thanks. I responded to one of his ominous queries with haste and straightened my neck out to face towards Miss Hart who was beginning the lesson. Around ten minutes in, the moment we were given tasks to do the remainder for the first half of the lesson, he pounced once again. So, Harry. 
Got any plans this weekend? His voice was incessantly beginning to sound almost intimidating as he peered down at my page, edging closer, pretending to examine my work. I'm busy all weekend with my dad and brother. We're going clay pigeon shooting. That ought to scare him off, I thought. Oh, how fun. Bring me back some shrapnel, will ya? He chuckled to himself for a moment, and then engaged his glare once more at my quivering eyes. I subtly nodded and tried to hold my focus to my work, doing my best to avoid eye contact with this creature of a man staring into my soul. You want to know what I'm up to this weekend? He stared at me, his mouth slightly ajar, waiting for my response with a foul grin. No, sir. I tried to reply plainly so he wouldn't delve into too much detail. I probably shouldn't have spoken at all. I'm going hunting. Yep. Me, my shotgun, and whatever damned creature finds itself in my way. I shivered at his disgusting habit. He wouldn't shut up about how much he enjoyed hunting, hiding from prey before pouncing, and most of all, he wouldn't stop discussing his 12-gauge shotgun. Hey, you want to see the shotgun? It's a real beauty. I have it in my car. Following my instincts, I sprang up from my seat and beckoned to let me leave for the toilet. I needed to get away from that freak. I had had enough of it. I swiftly made my way to the bathroom opposite and found a cubicle for me to sit down and try to take a few deep breaths before going back out and having to listen to that vile beast heckle into my ear about his guns, his hunting, his delirious lifestyle. My blood froze as I heard the door open with a loud slam coming from the door smashing into the wall. Harry, I know you're in here. Come with me, I want to show you how aw, awesome my cool gun is. My nerves seized up in seconds, and I reactively hoisted my legs up off the floor so he couldn't spot them from beneath the stall doors. Harry, I'm getting impatient. Come out quickly before Miz realizes we aren't going to the toilet. I was utterly stricken with terror at this point, and I certainly wasn't going to leave anytime soon unless he left me be. I heard footsteps slowly approach the cubicle door. It was him, that creature, had come for me. And now, a thin plastic door was all that held him back from me. His heavy breathing indicated that he was ready to break his way in if he needed to. Harry, I said come out! Please, can Mr. Hollard come to the head's office now? The speakers boomed down the corridors and through the closed bathroom door. Had I been saved? I'll be right back, Harry. Don't you dare leave now! <laughs> he laughed maniacally as he exited the room. And hearing the bathroom door close once more, I launched myself out of the cubicle and returned back to Miss Hart's class, far too afraid to try and speak out about what had just happened in fear I would be deemed a liar. All because of the rumors spread around by the years before us. Some god must have been watching over me, however, as the next day I came into class and Mr. Hollard was nowhere to be seen. And the same happened the next day, and the day after, and so on until it finally clocked that Mr. Hollard was gone. Whatever had gone down in the head's office, I will never know, but it saved me from whatever twisted plot he'd been using on me to try and get me to his car. I was terrified, but not yet scarred though I never dared to interact with another member of staff I hadn't known for the rest of school. Even now, age 30, and I still can't even fathom talking to someone new, even at work. I would be too cautious. I wouldn't let anyone else come so uncomfortably close to me again. I wouldn't risk it. I'm too afraid. My flatmate had always been strange. It was hard to put into words, other than she was unpredictable. You would never quite gauge what direction her mood would go in, or how she would react to anything you said. But then, one day, it was like something inside her just snapped. Whatever monster was lingering inside her finally decided to show itself. It was a dismal morning. 
Rain pattered dully against the windows, the sky overcast and gray, casting a shadow over everything. I was up late, since I had no lectures that morning, and snoozed my alarm, and the flat was unusually quiet. All I could hear was the soft plip of rain dripping from the gutters and the distant rumble of cars over wet tarmac. Stifling a yawn, I climbed out of bed and headed into the kitchen, desperate for some coffee. I didn't see her standing there until I already had the coffee pot in hand, about to pour it into my usual mug. She must have crept up behind me while I was distracted, tiptoeing in her socked feet, because I barely heard a squeak out of her until she whispered my name, her hot breath falling against my neck. I jumped, hot coffee spilling over my hand and dripping onto the floor as I turned to face her. April, what the hell? I blurted my cheeks flushing with a mixture of embarrassment and anger. She barked out a laugh. <laughs> Pour me a cup, too, was all she said, before sidling away, her red ponytail swinging over her shoulder. I shook my head in exasperation, grabbing some kitchen towels to mop up the mess. Half the things she did rarely made sense to me, but she always paid the rent on time, and it would be difficult finding another flat in the middle of the city if I left this one. I had to work with what I had, which meant putting up with her strange antics every once in a while. Pulling another cup out of the cabinet, I poured out two steaming mugs of coffee, adding cream and sugar to my own and leaving April's black how she liked it. Ah, perfectly bitter, she said as she took a sip, cradling the hot ceramic against her palm. Hmm, I muttered carrying mine back to my room so that I didn't have to deal with her before I was fully awake. I ended up leaving the flat an hour before my lecture started, with the excuse that I needed to visit the library. In reality, I just wasn't in the mood to deal with my odd flatmate. April wasn't in when I got home later that evening. It was autumn, which meant dusk fell earlier than usual, and the flat was full of shadows. I switched on the hallway light and shrugged out of my coat and shoes, calling out for my flatmate and receiving no response. Hmm, maybe she'd gone out somewhere. Making sure the door was locked behind me, I went to the kitchen to fill a glass with water, then carried it to my room, sitting down at my desk to go over my notes for the day. As I was poring over my notebook, I heard the floorboards creak behind me, and a cold feeling enveloped my chest as I glanced over my shoulder. I was alone in the room, but the door to my closet was partially ajar. Had it always been like this, or was I just being paranoid? Rain continued to patter against the windows, and even with my desk lamp on, shadows seemed to coalesce in the corners, stretching along the laminated floor. Another creak, and the shuffle of movement. It was definitely coming from inside the closet. There was something in there. I rose from my desk, swallowing back the lump in my throat. With trembling hands, I yanked open the closet doors and promptly screamed as a pale face stared back at me from the darkness, eyes wide and lips stretched into an unruly grin. It took a moment for me to gather myself before exploding in a fury. April, what the hell do you think you're doing? The girl cocked her head with a sly smile a strand of red hair drifting over her eyes. I didn't think you'd find me. What are you talking about? We're not playing hide and seek, I said incredulously. April simply giggled under her breath, stepping out of the closet. She was holding her hands behind her back, and I frowned. Was she hiding something? Seriously, what were you doing in there? You scared me, I said, shaking my head. God, what was the matter with this girl? April shrugged, sidestepping around me. One order takeaway? I'm starving. Um, no thanks, I muttered. With a shrug, she disappeared out of my room without letting me see her hands. But I thought I glimpsed something metallic in the reflection of my table lamp. With a sigh, I closed my bedroom door, wishing more than ever that I had a lock on it. That night wasn't good. I was woken up by voices. At first I thought I was dreaming, but... Even after I'd shaken myself awake and sat up in bed, I could still hear it. Frantic whispering coming from right outside my door. 
The air was chilled as I climbed out of bed, pulling on a robe as I padded towards the door. It sounded like multiple voices at first, but when I pressed my ear to the wood, I realized that there was only one. A single female whisper. April. Gritting my teeth in anger, I grasped the handle and threw open the door, stepping out into the darkened hallway. The landing was empty. But when I lifted my gaze, I glimpsed a shadow disappearing around the corner, the creeping of footsteps moving further away. What was she doing wandering around the flat at this time of night? I closed the door behind me and climbed back into bed. As long as she didn't disturb me, I was happy to leave her to her strange wanderings. I managed to drift off, but it wasn't long before my eyes fluttered open once again. It was still the dead of night, but something had woken me. The rain had finally stopped, and the silence was strangely forbidding, like it was trembling with a held breath. I turned over onto my side and recoiled with a scream. Someone was standing beside my bed. Fumbling backwards, I reached for the lamp beside my bed and switched it on, harsh yellow light filling the room. April was standing next to my bed staring down at me with a crazed look in her eyes. In her hand, she was clutching a steak knife, the one we normally kept in the kitchen drawer. April! Jesus Christ, what are you doing? The girl didn't respond. She merely stared at me with a crooked smile on her lips, a strange shadow in her eyes that made her look like a stranger. April, seriously, I said, a tremble in my voice. If you don't knock this off, I'm calling the police. She lifted her head then, blinking as though coming out of a daze, and started to laugh. It was a laugh that could only be described as guttural, like something was being torn out of her chest. She threw her head back and gurgled out a laughter until she couldn't breathe. Then she turned and walked straight out of my room, twirling the knife between her fingers. I ended up moving out. I could no longer deal with April or her volatile moods. Standing in my room with a knife was the last straw for me. I no longer felt safe around her. I'm glad I got out when I did, because her next flatmate, the one who replaced me, wasn't so lucky. When my brother told me that our mother was rushed to the hospital, I didn't believe him. At least not until I left the university campus, went home, found it empty, and rushed to the address he gave me over the phone call. My mother was never sick. She rarely even had a reason to use meds or see the doctor. I couldn't even recall a day when she complained about a headache. Hence, being surprised and disbelieving was inevitable for me. The moment I entered the hospital, I didn't know what to expect but my mouth lost the position to describe what my eyes saw. Not only was I speechless, but I didn't know how to react. My mother lay on the hospital bed. Her head was wrapped in bandages, her legs and hands too. She couldn't look at me with her swollen eyes and lips. I so wanted to know what happened to her and made her that way. My brother took me out of the room after a while. What happened? I asked him and he was both happy and sad to narrate the story. Happy because he could finally share the burden with someone. Sad because the story affected our mother. From my brother's side of the narration, the strange happening started before my father left the house. My dad and mom haven't had the best relationship since we were young. They fought at the slightest chance, argued, and were always at loggerheads. I never thought they would last together for as long as they did, their nothing close to smooth relationship was one of the reasons why I chose a university far from home. I didn't want to be involved with them, and I also prayed that they found peace together. It didn't mean I didn't love them. Two years after I departed from home, I received a call from my mother, narrating how my father packed his luggage and left her alone in the house. I thought it was one of her pranks, probably because she wanted to draw me home. So, I simply consoled her and told her that father would come back to her. After that call, I didn't check on her. It took another two weeks for me to become remorseful. My brother called and said that he'd gone home to meet mom 
because my dad indeed left her alone. I called my mother and apologized for my insensitivity. She accepted my apology and I ended it there. If my brother was at home with her, I had no reason to go there. I thought at the time that the reason my father left was either that my mother caught him cheating or because he finally figured out that he couldn't cope with my mother anymore. If that was how they wanted to end their marriage, so be it. What I didn't know was that my mother and father had started to draw closer, but some strange occurrences drove him away. My brother added in his narration that just before my father left the house, twice, he reported that he left dirty plates in the kitchen. But by the time he returned to wash the plates, they were washed and cleaned and back on the shelf and in the cupboard. My mother laughed so hard at the story that my dad felt very foolish. It didn't happen to my mother because she never washed the plates. My dad always did the washing, even when they weren't each other's best. It was a simple, unspoken rule. She simply told my dad that he was probably imagining things, and he washed the plates but forgot that he did. My dad never talked about the plate issue again. If that was all there was to it, perhaps he would have remained in the house with his wife. But as time went on, my father had more things to report and complain about to my mother. The tap was running when I woke up in the middle of the night. I didn't leave the gas on, but when I tried to cook this morning, I almost got burned. The floor of the sitting room was slippery this evening and full of water. Did you spill water by chance? My father was scared, but my mother thought that he was imagining things, making things up to show her off as the careless or insensitive one. Eventually, a big fight broke out between the two of them, and my father chose to leave the house. He didn't want to sound insane and chose to make that decision for peace. That's when my brother moved in. He said that all seemed well when he started to stay with mom, but that atmosphere of peace didn't last for long. The tables turned and strange occurrences came to my mother's notice. It was worse for her. She woke up to the feeling of someone sleeping beside her. At first, she thought she missed her husband, so she said nothing about it. But then it continued. She began to hear voices in her ear, running taps, running feet, and crashing plates. Fear enveloped her, and she eventually told my brother about it. She also told him about what happened when our father was still around. My brother comforted her, but said that it could be her imagination. They decided to stop imagining bad things and live peacefully pretending like those awful things weren't happening. And that worked for a while. But one day, out of the blue, my mother started to slap her face, scream and jump. It became really bad and my brother decided to take her to the hospital. The doctor gave her medicine and concluded that it was merely hallucinations. They returned home. With time, they hoped that all would be well and the imaginations would stop. But the worst came. My mother woke up early one morning, drawn by the sound of soft knocks on the door. She rushed out of her room, but first turned off the running tap in the bathroom. She was at the edge of the staircase when a voice whispered something in her ears. Hearing those words, my mother screamed so loud and slapped herself hard on the face. The motion caused her to slip and she bounced down the staircase and it ended up right at the feet of my brother who ran out of his room after hearing her scream. She lay on the ground, unconscious. That was the reason they were in the hospital, and that was the reason my brother called me. After checking on my mother and seeing that she was fine, we went back to the house. But what we saw scared us far more than all that had happened in the past few months. The house was filled with water in every corner. Broken plates littered the ground, and we could hear the running taps. We didn't need to be told to know. The house was haunted. By what or who, we would never know. Because once we packed what our hands and bags could carry, we never set foot in that house again. I checked my watch, tapping my feet against the sidewalk with an irritated sigh. He was late. I hoped this wasn't someone trying to swindle me or mess with me. I'd always been funny about buying things off sites like Craigslist since there were very few regulatory checks into the sellers of the items. 
I had no idea who I was meeting up with, apart from the slightly blurry picture of a young man. Maybe I should have done more research into who I was buying from before meeting up. At least he suggested a public place, rather than somewhere quiet and secluded. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, a voice said from behind me. I turned, my gaze falling onto a much more defined version of that profile picture. He was older than I expected, maybe in his early to mid-thirties, with close-cropped brown hair. I shrugged. No, I haven't been waiting long, I lied. Twenty minutes was longer than I would have liked to have waited, but there was no point in making a big deal out of it. He was giving me a good deal after all. I'm parked just up the street, he explained. I have the mirror in the car. I threw up my brow. Why didn't he just bring it with him? Did he expect me to follow him to his car? I glanced around the street. The road was fairly busy at this time of day, and there were a couple people walking around. If he tried anything funny, at least I wouldn't be alone. Did you drive here? He asked when I said nothing. I nodded, jerking a thumb to the old Ford behind me. Yep. He nodded, his eyes roaming over my face more intensely than I would have liked. I subconsciously stepped back, breaking his focus. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> I can go grab the mirror, he said. I didn't want you waiting for me any longer, Th that's all. I stuffed my hands back in my pocket, sighing softly. No worries, uh, I'll come and get it. It saves you walking all the way back. I knew I shouldn't be so nice, especially after him keeping me waiting, but I wanted to be done with this transaction so I could get back home. Meeting up with strangers like this always made me antsy anyway, especially when they were men. It comes with being a woman, I suppose. He started walking back towards his car, and I walked a little behind, maintaining a good distance between us. He didn't seem the sort to try anything, but you could never really tell. His car was a red pickup with some old carpets rolled up in the back. He noticed my gaze. Uh, oh, uh, I'm doing some renovating. That's why I wanted to get rid of this he said as he reached back into the seat and pulled out something wrapped in cloth. He peeled it back to show me that it was the mirror that I was expecting. <sighs> Perfect, I said, digging my purse out of my pocket. Uh, 20, right? He shook his head. Uh, knock it down to 15, he said, as an apology for being late. I blinked at him. Are, are you sure? He nodded offering me a smile, and I'd handed him the money, accepting the mirror in return. Uh, thank you. No problem. Pleasure doing business with you. I merely smiled and said goodbye before turning around and heading back to my car. By the time I glanced back, he already had driven away, which I was thankful for. Didn't have to worry about being followed. I drove back home, relieved that it had gone so smoothly. The last thing I needed was to meet up with some creepy guy, but he seemed all right in the end. When I got home that afternoon, I finally unwrapped the mirror and hung it up on my wall. I'd recently repainted and refurbished my bedroom, and the mirror had been a perfect finishing touch to match the rest of the decor. It looked brand new as well, which was even better. It wasn't till much later in the evening when I was in bed with the light switched off that I saw the small blinking light coming from somewhere in my room. It was a reddish hue. At first, I thought it might have been some type of reflection from outside, but my curtains were closed, and it didn't seem like it came from a car or a street lamp. I sat up, reaching for the lamp beside my bed, but as soon as the warm glow spread around the room, the light disappeared. Hmm, maybe I'm just imagining it. I switched the light back off, waiting for my eyes to readjust to the dark. There it was again, a faint red light, blinking at me from somewhere in the room. My eyes found it on the opposite wall, and I kept my gaze on it while simultaneously reaching for the light switch. I flicked it on and blinked. I was looking at the mirror, the new one I had just bought earlier this day. Why was there a red light coming from it? 
Nausea crept from my throat as the realization struck me. There was only one explanation I could think of. A camera. There was a camera in the mirror. That's what the red light was. It was recording, which meant when I got dressed earlier, the camera had recorded everything. The camera and whoever was watching on the other side. That disgusting creep. The light flicked off suddenly, and I shook my head. He must have realized that I figured it out. It didn't matter anyway. There was no way I was keeping this now. I pulled the mirror off the wall and headed downstairs to throw it in the trash. I heard the glass crack as it hit the side of the kitchen bin, but I didn't care. I wasn't having that thing in my house anymore. I was about to head back up to bed when movement in the corner of my eye made me turn around. A scream immediately tore from my throat. Someone was standing outside the kitchen window, looking in. I recognized the face immediately. It was the man who sold me the mirror. What the hell? He followed me here? But I checked. He drove away already. Unless, unless the red light wasn't a camera at all, but a tracking device. He grinned at me through the glass, his dark eyes flashing as he touched the window with his fingers. Panic threw me through my veins. I turned and ran upstairs, fumbling for my phone. I called the police, my hands shaking as I dialed the emergency number and almost dropped the phone when I heard something thump downstairs. Was he in the house? Oh my God. I ran into the bathroom, locking myself in when I relayed my address to the dispatcher, begging for them to hurry up. I hid in the bathroom when I heard the sirens. By the time the police came, the man was nowhere to be found, and the mirror was gone. Jeffrey bought our new house when I was four months pregnant and it was simply the most thoughtful thing anyone had ever done for me. The construction of the building was unamusing but assuring. It was a small house, smaller than our old apartment at the center of town, but what it lacked in grandness, it compensated for in spirit. We had our own influence over it, or so we thought. We had so much love in the house that we made so much love for the first month of our stay all three bedrooms of the room were a small universe, and we applied it to the most passionate of our desires. It was the reason Jeffrey and I had bought the house anyway. The fact that it was cheap on the market may have been a bonus. The house in its state would have cost us three times more on the market, but we loved our home for that, until strange things began to happen. Our first occurrence was a bestial cry deep in the middle of the night. It was a cry so urgent and so personal that it tore into my sleep. I roused with a slumbering laziness on my bed, careful with my bump, even as this aching cry snatched sleep from my eyes at such an odd hour. <laughs> I think something's in the house, Jeffrey said to me when he saw that I was awake. I could not believe my ears, and my heart was beating rapidly. What do you mean something is in the house? I queried, with a look of puzzlement. Jeffrey bleached white, and I sensed that he was afraid at that moment. I was too. Such a cry was unusual, echoing through the halls of the house. Jeffrey sat up on the bed and reached his hands across the sheets, a moment later, my hand was in my husband's. What do you think it is? I asked, incapable of deciphering if it was a man or animal. Huh? Jeffrey gasped. I swallowed. What do you think the crying is? I don't know, Jeffrey said. I stared into his eyes, and I could sense the sincerity of his confession. The unwillingness to investigate also baffled me. His quivering fingers twitched against the back of his palm, seeking warmth in my grip. He was so panicky. 
His hand sweated into mine. Fuck this, Jeremy. I cussed in frustration and slipped sideways and tried to tremble out of the bed. My heart was in a beating frenzy, shaking the muscles across my chest, but I knew I couldn't afford to stay put while my own horror consumed me. Where are you going? Jeffrey asked me. His face was so bleached pale that one would assume that he had been drained of blood. I wonder how long he had been up before I was awake. The crying continued, reading the night with its bleak tune. Please come back to bed. I'll call the cops, Jeffrey begged. I stopped in my stride and turned around to stare at him. And in that instance, the noise died down. The muffled cry was a singular repetition, rising and falling. The silence that followed was even scarier than the crying. We stayed up all night till the cops came in the morning. The house was haunted, they reported to us, and it was out of their own jurisdiction to handle such things, except that they had to break it down. Three of the last four families to stay in the house lost a family member. Nobody knew what it was, but the house was haunted, and the paranormal detectives could not tell what it was because they could not sense the spirits. We thanked them for their service and the cops left after an hour. Jeffrey and I were left in the haunted house with two options. I knew we couldn't afford to leave. Even if we could, it would be on such a short notice. So we took the latter option. We decided to stay in the house. All through the day, we carried on with our activities and chores in solemn silence. The atmosphere was heavy with mortal dread, and neither of us went out of our view for a long time. The swinging mood from our intense love to doleful sobriety made me very alert, and if I was afraid, I knew I could not show it. Not when Jeffrey was as afraid as he was. We stayed in this state of mind without anything out of the ordinary happening. Then, it was night again and the crying returned. Mm. <laughs> On its return, it introduced mm. depth into Jeffrey's anxiety. His face wasn't so white as his skin, but it was splotched and dotted unevenly as his fears. I should call the cops, he muttered at first, then decided against it because the cops only shown up at dawn. I should probably go check on it myself. He sighed, mustering bravery once the sound graduated from a cry to a stomping foot march around the house. I'll go with you, I said to him as he turned to me with a glazed pair of eyes. His fear had become palpable, a heightened emotion I could not access for some reason, even though I was afraid myself. No, he muttered, then turned the hinge of the door. A putrid odor contaminated the air once the door was open, and it sailed in my direction with compulsion. I knew something was in the house, but at that moment, it was certain. I realized the danger that we were in. The moment between my realization and the moment it sensed us was a flash. All I heard was something swooshing in our room forcefully and latching onto Jeffrey. Hungry. The hunchback brute with hair all over its body cried in a familiar tune. Meat, he roared. I blinked, but he had already sunk his teeth into Jeffrey's arm. His tough, muscular body made him impossible to shake off. The fact that Jeffrey and I were both paralyzed with fear at the instant of what we saw made it worse. Jeffrey! I screamed when I saw this nameless beast taking my husband apart before me. His attacks were unrelenting and savage in intensity. I unraveled in the moment of my utter terror and acted out of sheer impulse. I hurried to the side of the bed and I fetched the glass lamp with agile movement. The nameless beast was so taken by his onslaught on Jeffrey who was succumbing to his beatings 
that when I came from behind, he didn't even stir. I placed two hands on the handle of the lamp and swung it as hard as I could on his head. I could not say what sound I was expecting from such a violent thwack, but the beast's head did not crack. The sound was a dull thud that one would hear from a packet hitting the floor. The beast fell off Jeffrey and onto the floor, knocked out unconscious. Call the cops now, Jeffrey said to me, and I did as I was told. The cops arrived half an hour later to take away the horror of our lives. Our home was once again ours, and we watched them take away this strange-looking beast. The hunger to make some extra income drove me towards a part-time job at McDonald's a few blocks from my house. It didn't cost me extra money to close from work as an editor in a publishing company and arrive for my night shift at the fast food place. So as long as I was willing to work without any complaints, they were willing to hire me. I convinced the manager to assign me to the night shift permanently, and it posed no problem whatsoever. My routine was always the same. Wake up each morning, cook, prepare for the day, and arrive at the publishing house by 8 a.m. Once the clock struck 5 p.m., I rushed out and found my way to the fast food place. After closing at 9 p.m., I trekked down the few blocks that came before the condo where I lived. The sad part, however, showed up in how tired I was every evening. Of course, it wasn't easy for a person to spend more than 12 hours outside their home each day. If things went well, I hoped to make enough money to cover my debt within two years and then take a rest. But that drive didn't compensate for the stress that overwhelmed me every once in a while. Other times, I love the urge to cook or eat. Perhaps this could explain the indifference I felt one night after closing. I was on my way home, two blocks from my condo, when I heard footsteps behind me. They were silent and subtle, almost like the person wanted me to notice them, but also didn't want me to. I didn't look back for a while, but when the perfect blend of the silent steps and darkness indulged fear in me, I turned. Almost as soon as I did, my eyes caught sight of a shadow. Whoever it was, he ran down the neighborhood, and my impulse caused me to run after him. When I got nearer to the end of the block without catching up, I turned back and chose to return home. But I found myself turning back to look and make sure that no one was following me. I hated the fear that little encounter planted in me. When I got home, I double-checked my locks and shut all the windows, even the windows in my room. I cuddled with fear in my bed that night, hoping against all hope that what I encountered earlier was nothing more than an expensive joke my mind played on me. I slept it off. Sleep must have erased the memory of the previous night's scare, because when I woke up the next morning, I'd forgotten all about the chase and the mysterious stalker. I followed my usual routine and got ready for work. By 8 a.m., I was at my desk in the publishing house. By some minutes past 5 p.m., I arrived at McDonald's for my night shift. I didn't expect anything extra for the day. Customers trooped in and out as usual. But around 8 p.m., almost three hours after I arrived, I noticed a seat that was still occupied. I called the attention of one of the workers, and he agreed that the man who occupied the seat had been there even long before he arrived. It piqued my interest. Not because he looked homeless and shabby, but because every time I turned to look at the man, he looked away, like he had been studying me the whole time. I decided to do something about the whole weird situation and report to my manager, but because we were near closing hours, he resorted to leaving him. My lazy ass manager concluded that he would leave after the shop closed and that he wouldn't hurt anyone. To be honest, on the call it felt like he didn't want to be bothered with whatever he was doing that evening, so I let it slide. True to what my manager said, once the closing hour arrived, the man left without being cajoled. Although he didn't order one thing. I also left and started my journey back home. I wouldn't have remembered what happened to me last night. Not if it didn't happen to me again. I was not far gone when I heard the same footsteps behind me. Slow and subtle, 
as though the person wanted to, and also at the same time didn't want to be noticed. I turned sharper than I did the night before and didn't wait for the individual to run. I ran in their direction in the dark. But the person was smart, too. He took to his heels and hurried off ahead of me. I didn't catch up with him in the end. I loathed how tiredness had reduced me to the weakest version of myself. If it were any other day, or a day when I didn't have to work all day, I would have caught the man. But at least I was glad to have caught on to something. The person wasn't young, and they always ran in a zigzag manner. The next day, when I arrived at McDonald's, I was surprised to see the man that lingered the previous day in the same spot again. Maybe if he didn't pester the customers with his eyes and mannerless drools, I would have left him. But he caused so much pain just by sitting there that I had to alert my co-workers. The man refused to budge. I saw the frustration in the eyes of all of us and decided to lend a helping hand. I had once volunteered at a refugee camp, and so I had some knowledge of handling weirdos. I spoke with the man, and as soon as I did, he reasoned with me and agreed to leave with just one clause. Please, see me out. I nodded and followed the man as he exited the building. I shouldn't have laid my guard down, but how could I have known that he carried a dagger with him? We were barely outside when he retrieved his hand from his coat and thrust the sharp tool into my stomach. I screamed and fell to the ground. My co-workers came to me while I watched the man run away. In a zigzag manner. I should have known. He was the stalker. Blood gushed through my stomach like an open tap and I coughed. I wished with all my strength that it wasn't as bad as I thought and that I wasn't dying. But my eyes closed and my body surrendered to oblivion. Thankfully, I opened them again a few hours later. That's what the detective who stood guard by my side said. My surgery was successful and I would be out of the hospital soon. I was at least grateful that I didn't end up dead. Or worse, alive and handicapped. I asked about the man, and the detective assured me that he was caught and arrested. The detective said that the man confessed to having stabbed me, but he wasn't saying the reason. Or his excuse didn't seem like it. The man had claimed that he only wanted to test his new knife, and he felt like I was the perfect prey. I was scared to hear something like that. I told the police about the stalking, and the evidence made me know the man was the same. He took my statement and assured me that the man would pay for his crime. I thanked him for his efforts. Two weeks later, I was discharged. I still didn't give up my job at McDonald's. Even though I worked under constant fear, I had a mountain of debt to clear. I should have known something was strange about the place as soon as I saw it. The peculiar stains on the carpet, the old moth-eaten curtains, the thin layer of dust over everything. But the apartment had been cheap, and I'd been desperate. And at the time, I didn't notice the smell of rot, or the feeling that something wasn't quite right. For the first few days, I was hardly in the apartment. I'd taken on as many shifts as I could at work to pay for food and bills. And when I wasn't working, I was passed out on the couch asleep. It took me a while to even bother unboxing my meager belongings. And the place never felt like home just a place to sleep and eat after a hard day's work. It wasn't until about a week after I'd moved in, my first day off, that I noticed things were a little strange about the place. It was the smell that bothered me first, the smell of decay, of something rotting in the shadows. I bought a couple of cheap plugins to try and mask it, since I didn't have time to clean or find the source of the smell. It was probably just mold or damp, because the apartment was old and I'd seen water stains on the stairwell outside. But it was stronger in some areas than others, particularly where those gruesome reddish-brown stains were visible in the carpet. I did try to scrub some of them out with stain remover, but it did nothing, so I branded it a waste of time trying to clean it up. Then the scratching started. I figured a place like this probably had a rodent problem, rats in the walls, that's all it was. 
it didn't even bother me that much if it was rats, so long as they didn't chew through the walls or cables. Until it started to keep me awake at night. I'd be roused from the middle of sleep to the sound of scratching right beside my head, tiny claws itching at the plasterboard on the other side of the wall, next to where I was sleeping. It would stop and start in little bursts, never straying too far away from my head. I moved the bed, nothing but a makeshift pile of blankets and pillows really, several times, but the noises followed me around the room, almost as though they could sense I was there. Eventually I moved my bed right into the middle of the room, where those stains had bled into the carpet. I thought that being away from the walls would mean the rats left me alone, but it only got worse. It was around 2 o'clock in the morning when I finally finished my shift and collapsed straight into bed without bothering to change out of my work clothes. I fell asleep almost immediately, as exhausted as I was. I couldn't be sure how long had passed when something woke me up. At first I couldn't recall what it was and lay gazing into the darkness of the room for a few seconds. Then I felt it. Something was tugging at my blankets, right where my feet were. I bolted up, fumbling for my phone to shine a light over the bed, still feeling the pressure of something pulling at the edge of the blanket. Was it a rat? Had they somehow gotten into the apartment now too? I found my phone and switched on the flashlight function, shining it over the room. For a fraction of a second, I thought I saw a shadow slip out of sight, but it was too dark to see clearly. I pulled up all of the blankets, searching for any sign of the rodent, but there was nothing there. Had I imagined it? Maybe I thought I felt something in my half-asleep state? I shook my head, replacing the bedding and laying back down. The night had gone quiet now. I couldn't hear the rumble of cars or music pounding out of nightclubs. Even the city had fallen silent. But the rats had not. As I lay staring up at the ceiling, I heard the ch 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 of nails. Only this time it was coming from beneath me. Beneath the stained carpet, beneath the floorboards, directly beneath my head. If I really concentrated, I thought I could feel it too, the vibrations running through the foundations. I tried to ignore it and fall back asleep, but the feeling of something tugging at my blankets was still weighing on my mind, and I was starting to wonder if it was a rat at all. I curled up my knees so that my feet weren't near the edge of the blanket, and finally drifted off. Things continued like this for the next few days, and I was starting to get more and more fatigued between the brutal work shifts and my sleepless nights. I decided to ditch the bed and sleep on the couch instead. It was in the room across the hall, opposite a small television that hardly had signal most of the time. One night, about two weeks after I'd moved there, I was sleeping on the couch when the television turned on by itself. I woke up, leery and confused, to the room filled with static. Ahead of me, the TV screen was nothing but a grainy black and white picture. Fumbling for the remote, I switched it off and tried to figure out why it had turned on. Some kind of power reset? I couldn't have touched the remote by accident in my sleep since it was on the floor, nowhere near the couch. I tried not to worry about it and was almost drifting off when I felt a shift in the air. It's hard to describe, but it almost felt like I wasn't alone all of a sudden. The shadows seemed too thick. The air felt too still, and a crippling sense of unease began to fill my stomach. I chalked it down to being overworked and exhausted, telling myself it was nothing. I closed my eyes, pulled the covers up to my chin, then jerked awake with a start, my eyes wide. Something had touched my cheek, a breath or a whisper, I couldn't tell, but I had felt it, like a cold breeze on my skin. I searched frantically through the darkness of the room for any signs of an intruder, but saw nothing. When I'd finally regained my composure, I got up and switched on the main light. I jumped to my feet, switching on the light. The bulb had no lampshade, hanging loose from the ceiling, but it provided enough illumination to see the room was empty. I knew I hadn't imagined it, but I couldn't rationalize it either. I spent the rest of the night searching the apartment. I was the only one there, which meant there was only one explanation. The apartment was haunted. 
I spent the next few days asking around trying to gather as much information as I could about the apartment until my search led me to the local library. I found the articles in the library's archive. After typing in my apartment's address, a flood of them appeared on the screen. As I scanned the headlines, it quickly became apparent that I was right. There were news reports dating back to 2013, all the way up to this year. Gruesome murder in downtown apartment. Unsolved murder shakes apartment residents. The tragic death of an unfortunate woman. Residents claim apartment to be haunted by unsolved murder victim. I'd read enough to know that the apartment had a sordid history and that the past had yet to be put to rest. I also knew that I had too much on my plate to deal with anything beyond the living, so I ended up moving out shortly afterwards, before things could get any worse. <laughs>